Welcome to the Climate and Coordination Rcast, where every week we'll be discussing topics related to all things climate change and our chain's role in the solution. We will be discussing technologies that can adapt and coordinate massive amounts of data like never before, forming social architectures that grow collective intelligence, sharing and evaluating data planetarily, all while maintaining personal privacy and personal data ownership. A new decentralized economy is forming as we move from the third industrial revolution digitization, to the fourth, decarbonization, by building a co-op built on a correct by construction, concurrent, scalable solution, our chain is structured to build out the new technology that will be required for a flourishing regenerative of planet. Please join us on this journey. Um, okay, welcome to this week's iteration of the Climate and Coordination Orcast, and um, Happy Chinese New Year as well. Um, so there are lots of different uh, things we want to talk about today because there's a lot happening. Um, but the first story that I have today is from CBS News, and actually this was shared um, previously by Greg and some others, but I wanted to share it um, today because I felt it was um, really relevant to where the world kind of is right now in the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And the headline, um, this is from, let's see, February 5th. um, And it says climate change may have played a key role in coronavirus pandemic, according to a study. Um, I just want to say at the outside of this that this connection has not been completely confirmed. Obviously, it's th- they're studying this and trying to understand where these different viruses come from. But I'm just going to read a very short little section of this. And it just says, um, human-caused climate change may have played a key role in the coronavirus pandemic. That's the conclusion of a new study which examined how changes in climate have transformed the forests of Southeast Asia, resulting in an explosion of bat species in the region. The researchers found that due to changes in vegetation over the past hundred years, an additional 40 species of bat have moved into the region, carrying with them a hundred more types of bat-borne coronaviruses. Oh, good. Um, Bats are known carriers of coronavirus or coronaviruses with various species carrying thousands of different types. Many scientists believe the virus that started the worldwide COVID-19 pandemic originated in bats in Southern China's Yunnan province or uh, neighboring areas before it crossed paths with humans. Anyway, this is an interesting article because it goes on to explain sort of the connections between climate and disease, especially with insects, also rising temperatures and the spread of different disease And then, of course, um, poaching, which also has a major impact on um, different environments, but also can introduce diseases. So um, it seems like um, the conclusion that can be made is that leaving nature more alone and trying to be less destructive in nature will make it so that the conditions for another pandemic are not as likely that seems like what the conclusion is to me, but I would love to hear if anybody else has thoughts on this. Um, oh, I've got lots important. of thoughts on this one. Okay, great. But partly because I do remember on a previous call, previous podcast, that I um, put an article out there for whoever was on that call, all of us certainly, um, that started to link speculatively, albeit, Gaia and COVID-19. Um, and I've posted two in the chat, so um, I haven't posted the same one. So this, the last one, Schumacher College, is from a guy called Stefan Harding, who is uh, the program lead for MSCs in holistic science, the sort of science you need to understand the Earth as Gaia, as, an, as a system itself with interrelationships. And um, he's saying the same thing. And then the one before, which is a BBC link, is uh, uh, James Lovelock, the guy that came up with Gaia at the beginning, many moons ago. 
he tur just turned 101. And this is a two and a half minute interview with him at the age of 101, whilst COVID is around, right? And him talking about the inevitability of COVID-19 in the face of population growth of humankind in the planet and the way in which humankind clusters and changes the environment. And he sees it as an entirely natural thing as part of the regulation mechanism of Gaia. So all supporting the article that you posted. Yeah. And I really like that this article doesn't explicitly say for sure what the connection is, because I know that this is, you know, a developing story, but, um, and I think probably it'll take much more observation to really know for sure, but it seems obvious to me, um, you know, don't mess with the pancreas, the IRS and mother nature. I mean, that's kind of, <laughs> you know, square one, I think. So um, if there aren't any more comments on that, um, I have another story as well. And this was sent to me by Daryl. So thank you so much, Daryl, for sending this. Um, this is from, well, actually, this is being um, talked about all over the place, but I picked the Wall Street Journal. Um, this is from February 11th, so this is basically breaking news from about a day or two ago. It says here the headline is Shell hits its own peak oil plans to reduce output. So Ooh. peak oil is something that I just really recall from my childhood hearing about all the time. People would debate this. Um, when was it going to come? Would we know uh, what's going to happen to the markets? All this stuff. And now here comes a headline today in 2021 saying that Shell has hit peak oil. And they say here, um, they think that um, they expect their output to decline, it says here, by 1% to 2% a year. But I think that it could decline much faster than just 1% or 2% a year. I think it could be a lot faster than that, especially because I think there are probably going to be other oil companies that have similar announcements coming up. And... Um, I'm not sure if people realize, but there was also an oil spill in the San Francisco Bay uh, this past week. Chevron spilled over 600 gallons of oil, which was very um, <sighs> disappointing to people there. And so I think, you know, the time of oil is really kind of ending. There's, I mean, we, I know we've been talking about this for a long time, but there are some real um, signs uh, I think this latest peak oil announcement is um, just one of the latest. So I'd love to hear if anybody has comments on this. But it's really struck me to see this as a headline, finally. Well, it was first sort of talked about as we've got to peak oil. I mean, peak oil was talked about way before. Um, but it first started to be talked of about being at or just past the peak back in September of October last year. So not surprising that Shell's come to the same conclusion because BP came to that conclusion, I think back in September, October. Um, you know, so, so it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good thing that these companies I think are saying that because it will hopefully um, force them to look for other ways of generating energy that are more sustainable. Yeah, well, I what I'm worried about is what's it going to do to share prices? Because yeah, normally when a commodity starts to be scarce, you know, it 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 goes up in price. Will that mean their sh their share prices will rocket, hmm. or not? That maybe is why they're announcing it because you know these companies knew fell full well about this long ago. It's, it's hmm. what, what's interesting about this is that they've chosen to announce it. So. Uh, Perhaps that's their strategy um, because they realize that peak oil demand has happened. So perhaps this is their method of uh, mm. staying alive. But what, what I also find interesting, whenever I hear the word peak oil, my mind Im immediately goes to uh, Johan Gultung, um, their Norwegian um, peace negotiator who... Um, 
uh, wrote a book, a, a, a paper back in 2009 called The Fall of the U.S. Empire and Then What? Um, and he predicted that the fall of the U.S. Empire would happen in 2020. This was back in 2009 when he made this prediction. Now, his prediction was based around the idea that oil, this was pre-fracking, right? So, so the oil industry actually managed to squeeze out a last gasp through fracking that, you know, actually accomplished U.S. to become oil independent. Um, so a lot of people were kind of tossing aside Johann Galtung's um, prediction because, you know, um, but um, it would appear that in some ways, um, he might be still on track as far as the beginning of the end. Um, cause 2020 was also the year that a lot of people say that the Chinese economy surpassed the U S and, uh, but it's an interesting paper because it kind of talks about how empires rise and fall. And I've talked about this before around energy sources. Um, but it also talks about the British empire and how it kind of, it's kind of decline would probably be more comparable to the U.S.'s decline, where it wouldn't be as dramatic and violent. Uh, hopefully, hopefully it will be kind of more of a slow, slow transition. Um, but anyway, those are my thoughts. When was, I think was the Roman Empire a, a bloody transition in the end? Or, or, or was it more like that of Egypt, as Egypt got consumed by, um, essentially, by Rome? All right, next week we need to have a historian on to help us. We need to invite somebody who's an <laughs> expert in this stuff. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm, the reason I'm kind of wondering is, is, is because um, I'm wondering if, if, if all of these major changes, like the end of the British Empire, fall of the Roman Empire, fall of the Greek Empire and so on and so forth. Um, are they, do they happen in, as a step function, like suddenly they're gone? Or actually is it sort of more of a slope that they sort of wither and die and become subsumed by whatever was replacing? There may be a war involved in it or some conflict. But yeah. It might just be, yeah, when you look at it like that, and if it's not yeah. over bloody, yeah. it's kind of, it comes back to Lovelock and Gaia and all these things. Yeah, because we're part of Gaia, we're right. expressing ourselves in the context of being part of Gaia without knowing it, socially as well as individually. And socially what happens is we're quite a warring species. So we have little fights and things change in how we collaborate. Um, it's just that now, that when, when things go wrong, they go wrong at a on such a scale that we start impacting Gaia itself. Well, and, and because Gaia of globalization back and, too. Yeah, and Gaia will come back, get back and bite us. Right. As it is. She As is. it is. She'd say she. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Mm. Um, I do have a third story here, and this is like, I have to say, this is one of the most shocking reports I've ever seen. <laughs> And I don't want to, you know, um, I don't know what the phrase is, but I really think that you'll agree with me. I just put it in the chat. This is from The Guardian. This was shared a bunch on Climate Twitter recently, and this is from um, February 9th. This is so crazy. The headline says, invisible killer fossil fuels caused oh, yeah. 8.7 million deaths globally in 2018 so this is really shocking 8.7 million deaths is an absolutely huge number of people um obviously the main cause of this is air pollution yeah um there are i'm sure a lot of other factors um including natural disasters and things like that but air pollution is extremely deadly um, it says air pollution caused by the burning of fossil fuels such as coal and oil was responsible for 8.7 million deaths globally, the staggering uh, one in five of all people who died that year. Countries with the most prodigious consumption of fossil fuels to power factories, mm. homes and vehicles are suffering the highest death tolls, with the study finding that more than one in 10 deaths, both in the United States and Europe, were caused by the resulting pollution, along with nearly a third 
of deaths in Eastern Asia, which includes China. Death rates in South America and Africa were significantly lower. Um, so this is an astounding piece, and it even goes to talk about the researchers even being shocked themselves and almost not wanting to publish it because they felt it was maybe not going to be believed or that it surprised them so much. Um, so this is really crazy. And it goes on to explain, um, I just want to read one more paragraph from this, but if anybody's interested in this piece, I highly recommend reading it. It's very well cited and it's not that long. Um, it says here, scientists have established links between pervasive air pollution from burning fossil fuels and cases of heart disease, respiratory ailments, and even the loss of eyesight. Without fossil fuel emissions, the average life expectancy of the world's population would increase by more than a year, while global economic and health costs would fall by about $2.9 trillion, which is a staggering amount of money. So basically, um, you know, we have to transition away from fossil fuels immediately. And I'm really enjoying, although this is a horrible report, I'm sure the figures for 2019 and 2020 are also going to be shocking. Um, but um, I'm really enjoying the fact that no matter how you look at this issue of fossil fuels, whether you understand it through economics, public health, climate change, however you understand it, there is no doubt that we absolutely have to make this transition as fast as possible. There's really no place to hide. Um, I know that a lot of people used to, um, you know, hide within the economics. That's now not possible anymore. Um, and from a public health perspective, I think it's becoming way more difficult to justify staying in this pattern. Um, and that's not even to mention all of the potential like civil conflicts and wars and all of that stuff that arises from climate. Um, so yeah, I'd love to hear anybody's comments and that's the, that's the last of the stories that I have mm. um, for today. So. Well, that's, ra that's rather an apt one, I must say, because it was in this country um, last year, uh, November, December, I've pasted the link in, but for the first time in the world, um, air pollution was on was the cause of a person's death on their death certificate in the UK. And it was a little girl called Ella who died in 2013 after an asthma attack. And they went to the High Court to have the death certificate um, make it clear that air pollution was in fact the cause of her death. So for the first time in the world last year, we've got now one uh -huh. so now there's a precedent and that changes yeah. somewhat because if it's air pollution and say your local council makes decisions that increases the air pollution now you've got something that you can fight them with in the courts wow yeah i i remember um the first year i was in london um this was 1990 293 something like that there was a train strike and um because there was a train strike everyone was taking their cars into the city and at the same time there was a an inversion over the city so all of the extra exhaust was was being stuck over the city it wasn't flowing past and then on top of that uh there was um a uh, a ragweed um blossoming like unlike they'd, they'd seen in years and i remember i was in tip-top shape i i the I, I went to the pool every morning you know before sunrise i had I, in the morning i was swimming a mile and by and by mid-afternoon i was flat on my back in my bed feeling like i was running a four minute mile I could, I could every, every, I would pass out. And when I would pass out, I would stop breathing. So <laughs> we called the doctor and they rushed out. Um, so I had pollution induced asthma. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I could easily have died. Wow. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy, man. 
That is shocking. I'd, I'd like to play a little devil's advocate on this article. Sure. Uh, and I, just before you say that, can I just say one more thing and then you can yeah, say that? Yeah, sure. I just wanted to say, I've just noticed like, it's really interesting that the world seems to be really plagued by respiratory problems. Like first we've got the fossil fuel thing, then we've got the coronavirus, and then we've also got a huge explosion in wildfires, which causes a lot of smoke pollution. So it's like, it's just really fascinating to me. I wonder what's going on that everything seems to be a respiratory problem, but go ahead, Daryl. I can't breathe. (laughs) <laughs> yeah right and then there's uh-huh. that one too yeah. a fourth meaning yeah exactly um yeah so um so i'm gonna play a little bit of devil's advocate i mean don't get me wrong you know i uh i think i'm not disputing this study at all and i do believe that fossil fuels are killing us in the form of climate change um but um uh sometimes studies like this kind of you know don't really take a kind of a bigger picture of things um there, you can also cite examples of fossil fuels saving millions and millions and millions of lives. Uh, you know, one quick example would be ambulances. Um, you know, we don't yet have a fleet of electric ambulances yet. So if someone's dying and they need to get to the hospital quickly, the only way to do it is with a fossil fuel car. Uh, so, you know, it's, you kind of have to take you know, that into account that fossil fuels also save many, many, many lives. I wonder how many people who are having an asthma attack from air pollution get taken to the hospital in a yeah. fossil fuel ambulance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah isn't that ironic? But that's um, the, no, but you're right. right you're right. You're right. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't just stop. <laughs> that's the point. There's a transition. Yeah. I, I think with the Biden story that you mentioned, you know, the five things. Right. <clears throat> yeah, one of the things in there is is he, he's trying to make sure that um, uh, any federal uh, projects um, uh, properly assess their climate impact. Well, obviously, you know, I mean, in this country, in the NHS, um, the same is true. You know, we were going to have a coal mine up in Cumbria um, and the Conservative current government who and Boris is going to chair the climate summit, you know, bizarrely. Um, so they've got this coal mine that's going to go up, you know, totally against all of the fossil fuel thing. Um, and um, the pressure has now been so enormous that the council that, that agreed to have this new coal mine, the first in 38 years in the UK, is now revisiting the decision um, and l- looking to take into account the latest suggestions and recommendations that the UK government has made on you know, carbon neutral. And so it's unlikely that that's going to happen. Well, the same thing in this country, at least, could happen with the ambulance service and, and you know, mandating that there's no new um, uh, uh, petrol-based or diesel-based ambulances. It'd be very easy to do. I know a lot of the bus the companies bus are going that way, that, that way. But a lot of them are looking to um, uh, use electric-based buses, for instance, in Brighton. They're all over the place. It's well, coming. It's it, coming. It, yeah, it makes financial sense. They're cheaper now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, something that occurred to me whilst we were talking about some of this is I posted this organization, organization called ClientEarth.org. What's interesting about Client Earth is they did the case that got that death certificate registered as due to pollution, right? And, and so I looked at Client Earth and, you know, they're a charity. And I was thinking maybe our chain, I might table this at a board meeting should donate you know 50 bucks and become a corporate member Um, because what they're doing in particular is they are funding um, legal challenges around the globe to anything that damages the climate might be a use of our chain in some of this Mm. i reckon there's a use case there somewhere but because yeah they're very they're very prominent seemingly i think aligning with them yeah would be a pretty cool thing to do and very in keeping with this call let's do it mm. so yeah um daryl i'm very happy to turn it over to you if you want thank you um so uh i first of all i'd just like to um post an article that ian put in the chat because it's quite interesting um the headline <laughs> is bitcoin consumes more electricity than argentina um and the article goes into uh talking about um uh, Elon Musk and his investment in Bitcoin 
um, which is uh, perhaps not the best PR for him um, if he's um, truly concerned about climate. Um, so that's kind of it slow, slow, slow down a little bit because I, I also posted something that uh, a lot of these uh, Bitcoin miners are using renewables for their electricity. Yes, it's not all that bad. That's true. This is true. And there are uh, certain Bitcoin based companies that, you know, claim that they exclusively use renewables as their sources, uh, like Bitfury. Yep. Right. There are mining operations that, that locate near uh, large sources of hydroelectric power. Um, yeah. And al also in, uh, in very cold places where they don't have to spend as much energy on keeping the, uh, the servers cool. So the next question to ask ourselves is what percentage of of uh, Bitcoin is being mined that way. And yeah, there was a study. And so the second article goes, goes into that. Oh, okay. So I think uh, they say 39% of the proof of work um, is coming from renewable energy. Okay, 39%. Yeah, but that's growing, I, I believe. Yeah, so I guess in theory, if renewables do kind of continue on their trajectory, then Bitcoin will be, will be perhaps less, less evil that way. However, Bitcoin is continuing to climb too. So, uh, well, much more efficient is the proof of stake, and so someone's uh, doing a screen share. So, so sorry, the, I, I was muted. I didn't realize. So the point of the. the of putting the slide up is to show what the impact is on uh, on Bitcoin's blockchain of spending all this the same amount of electricity as the of the island of Ireland. That's this many kilowatt hours. It's a big number, right? And the cost of that energy is given as, as 13 pence per kilowatt hour. So the cost to Ireland is, you know, this large number. Right. So if that's actually the amount of energy being used by Bitcoin's blockchain uh, back when this was true, it's, it's probably more now. Uh, then the, and you look at the number of transactions per second and then the number of transactions in a year, then the real cost per transaction of using Bitcoin's blockchain is actually close to 10 pounds. That's probably close to 12, 13 dollars. So the idea that it's cheap is not true. If you value the energy just as the energy, it, you know, without any opportunity costs, like, you know, the cost of chopping a, a tree down or a forest, if you just looked at it as renewable energy, the, co the real cost of the transaction is bloated by 12 to $13 based on, on those numbers. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's correct. So, so it's <laughs> the, the, the hype around Bitcoin sort of, prevents people from seeing the, 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 all the challenges that it's facing. Indeed. It is surprising though that, that Elon Musk <clears throat> hasn't picked up on that. Um, uh, but I'm still hoping that he's more interested in a currency for the multiverse. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, uh, so we'll see where he goes with that. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. I don't know if you heard about this one, Nora, but uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, you, know, you should tell the story, Greg, because you, know, you asked us to go on Twitter and, and, and add our comments and like your comment. Why don't you tell that story? Oh, yeah. Uh, Lex Friedman, who's a podcaster who uh, knows Elon and also has been featured on Joe Rogan's podcast, I think, four times. Uh, he posted... Um, something to the effect that, you know, Bitcoin was the currency for planet Earth and Dogecoin was the currency for, for Mars. <clears throat> and um, and I, I posted, uh, and our chain is the currency for the galaxy. And Amen. Then, <laughs> yeah, and then that's Steve, great. Steve one-upped us all and said, no, our chain is the currency for the multiverse. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, a bunch of people piled on that. That was a lot of fun. So I have a couple technical questions. All right, let's hear them. 
Okay, so one's really short, and it's also uh, a tweet that you did recently. Um, okay. Um, chain, the only blockchain that, when you add hardware, it scales. And so I was just wondering if you could explain that in a more layperson perspective from both the angle of how Archain does it and how other blockchain approaches to scaling don't achieve it. Yeah, so it's, it's really, um, it's a combination of um, uh, technologies in Archain. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned um, before, uh, the, the issue is not just improving the, con, the uh, consensus algorithm. So improving the consensus algorithm helps a lot, um, as we just talked about. But the, the real, the second issue um, has to do with um, whether or not you're able to take advantage of the hardware uh, as a result of the way you're processing the transactions. So let's assume that you've already achieved consensus efficiently. Um, then even if that's the case, if your mechanism for processing transactions forces you to process them one at a time, um, then all of the transactions are gonna be, you know, piled up in on end. But, you know, the, the, the analogy I've given over and over again is, is like the, the multi-lane freeway. If you have a multi-lane freeway um, and there isn't very much lane crossing, right? So everyone pretty much finds their lane and stays in their lane. Then that, if you have n lanes, you're getting roughly n times the throughput um, uh, than a single lane freeway. And what this corresponds to is the fact that um, most transactions are isolated from each other. So, you know, just think about all your friends. Unless you or your friends are paying each other, uh, almost certainly most of your transactions in a, in a day are separate from each other. Uh, and that's certainly the case when you start moving outside of jurisdictions, right? So the, the, the point is that, Daryl, when you, you know, if you bought some coffee this morning at a, at a coffee shop, almost certainly that transaction and the resources it touches is separate than Steve buying a cup of tea um, in, the, in the UK. Uh, so as a, as a result, um, each of these transactions could find its own lane. And so they could all go down the freeway together at the same time. But if your means of processing the transactions forces you to put one transaction after the other. They don't go down the freeway at the same time. They're all funneled down to one lane. So you can imagine what happens <laughs> if you were to take an in-lane freeway and funnel all those lanes of traffic down to one lane. That's the issue. So what you need to, what you need to have is after you've solved the efficiency of the, con of the consensus algorithm, you need to be able to detect when it's possible to run all those transactions, you know, side by side. They can all run down the freeway together, so to speak. Um, and our chain does that um, because the way we, the way we represent transactions uh, in the row calculus or in row lang, uh, we can detect the conflicts, i.e. touching the same resources based upon which channels are utilized in the transactions. And, um, and so we don't have to rerun the transactions to, de to, to determine if there's a conflict. We can statically just look at the form of the rolling and see if there's any kind of conflict. And we now have proof um, that even for 20 branches, um, the conflict detection is still sub-second. Uh, and, uh, and um, and then when you merge 20 branches, that's happening in, in uh, uh, about six seconds. That's 20 branches worth of transactions is happening in about six seconds. So what that means is that as you add validators, you're effectively adding more lanes to the freeway. So you can get more and more transactions flowing side by side instead of end on end. Um, and so 
validators corresponds to hardware. So as you add more hardware, um, you get uh, more and more throughput through the system. Now, of course, there's a, you know, it's the, the law, um, there are, you know, diminishing returns. But right now, you know, you can get hundreds of these things side by side. Um, and you will increase at a near linear uh, um, growth rate. Uh, so, but this is exactly the opposite of what happens with Ethereum and Bitcoin and other kinds of systems. As you add hardware, they slow down because you get more and more contention for the resources. Okay. So, that, so, so he's, he, I, I just want to try out a little analogy, right? So um, imagine, Daryl, you go to Starbucks near where you live, and I go to Starbucks near where I live. It's just that I'm in the UK and you're in Canada. So when I pay for my Starbucks coffee and you pay for yours and, that, that, and that it's registered on the till and goes, therefore, into the digital world to be accounted for, the UK accounts for its stuff and the, the Canada Starbucks accounts for its stuff, right? And, and it may be that it gets rolled up in Canada or it may be that it's done by region and the same here in the UK. But essentially, if, if we had to wait for Starbucks headquarters to validate the transaction, we would be waiting a long time and our coffee would be cold. And so there's a natural way of organizing that's evident in the real world, Starbucks just being one example, as to how we understand concurrency of transactions and and the benefit of so doing because without that we couldn't scale businesses internationally <coughs> it's impossible and actually i would say what our chain does over and above that is first of all it recognizes that sort of pattern but it also makes it possible for um, those patterns to spring up more dynamically rather than being engineered by some sort of enterprise architect types helping to set up these multi international businesses. Mm. Is, okay. it, is that, is that, does that sound right to you, Craig? Yes, indeed. Absolutely. So, okay. This is interesting. Yeah. Cause those, those analogies help. And um, um, the idea of, you know, adding another validator is like adding another lane to the highway. Um, that's, that's a really nice, simple thing for me to visualize. Adding another coffee. Coffee, adding another Starbucks. Yeah, yeah, and the idea of you know your analogy of the Starbucks being the same company, but they have different. Um, you don't have to have Starbucks, the grand corporation, you know, validating every transaction before the next and one. And I remember made. Steve Henley and I were talking about this, and we mentioned that Steve had his analogy about adding cooks to the kitchen, and I said something about how when you add a cook with our chain, the kitchen continues to grow as well. Right. So here's my question. Um, another one. And this is well, actually, okay, so this is connected to my second question anyway. So um, the question is, are there other blockchain approaches that are like, like DAGs that also kind of have some form of uh, uh, parallelism, maybe not necessarily concurrency, but you know, other, other, are there other approaches that can also scale with, with hardware? Uh, yes. So Hashgraph is a really uh, interesting example where, but most of them focus the, the, the structure on the, on the consensus algorithm. So, so they're, they're trying to squeeze more out of the consensus okay. rather, rather than out of the transaction processing itself. Oh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. So, so, so what we've done is we've, we've, we've divided the problem into two. We said, you've got to improve the consensus algorithm and that's easy pickings, right? Improving proof of work is, is child's play. Um, proof of stake? Pro proof of stake is one example, but, but the, the fact is there's, oh, just, I see. there's just an infinite universe of improvements, right? Like, you know, like the, the main thing was people needed to, to open their eyes that, that lockstep consistency was not necessary and it's not the way the world works. I see, okay, okay. Um, like a really good example, if we want to get back to Gaia, is the mycelial network. Um, 
you know, the, 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 the mushrooms have grown this giant, you know, <laughs> the biologists are now calling it the wood wide web. <laughs> uh, but, you know, they, they've, they've grown this giant network and, so, uh, uh, you know, underground and the trees literally send resources to one another over this network. I and mean, this is document. It's like a brain. Um, yeah, it's a giant, it's a giant brain. But the, but the, the fact, I mean, related to our, 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 our discussion here, the fact is that, you know, there, there doesn't need to be a king tree that's organizing everything. <laughs> and, and nobody, no local tree necessarily has an up to date global view. Right, they're going to have a view that is as up to date as is necessary for them, for them to get done what they need to get done. <laughs> um, whereas, you know, algorithms like Paxos make sure that everybody has an up to date global view, and that's why it's too slow for for you know um, global scale kinds of things. So that's uh, that's. That's one place where you can improve is the, is the consensus algorithm, but you also need to improve the transaction processing. Now, the thing that our chain does that is really unique is to propose one model of computation, which allows you to tackle all of those problems. A single simple model of computation where you can do static analysis to detect conflict. Hey. It just it just shows up because of the syntax, the you know, just looking at the shape of the computations, you can go, oh, okay, these computations are isolated, or oh, okay, these computations are going to step on each other's toes, and so we have to sequence them. But back to the highway, when they step on each other's toes, that's the equivalent of uh, cars in adjacent adjacent lanes having to merge into change, one lane. Yes, change change lanes. Yeah, change yeah. lanes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, in computer science, there's a notion of, 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 of a lock uh, for mutex, mutually, mutual exclusion, in order to continue. So if, if, you, if you go back to, uh, I think it's Lord of the Flies or something like that, you know, they have the conch. Whoever has the conch in the circle can talk, right? So the way that, that, or, that, that most models of computation work, there's some notion of a conch. So it's not like when you're... When you're doing something on your computer, on your laptop or your phone or anything like that, whilst on, particularly on your laptop, whilst you think you've got lots of things going on in parallel, because you can set up different things that are doing things like printing and uh, editing and w r looking at a couple of movies all at the same time, it's not really happening concurrently on a single processor. What's happening is it's context switching super quick. So you don't see it. Mm. So it does a bit of work right? Hands a conch onto some, some, some other process. That does a bit of work and so on. And it just goes round and round really, really quick. When you have multiple cores in a computer, then you can actually have four things going on. Yeah. But that means you have to understand that they're not going to tread on the toes because if the four things that, are gonna, that could go on yeah. onto, say, a, a four-core processor all require the same resource, the resource still has a conch shell one of them only can have the conch shell at right. a time. And so you don't get any parallelism. So if you can figure out that the conch shell that each of the four needs to have are indeed different, they can all progress at precisely the same time. Yep. And, and that's kind of where process algebra comes into trying to understand um, uh, where you have uh, these these conflicts and where row calculus comes in to be able to resolve those conflicts so that you can um, maximize parallelism. Okay, okay. So so this is connected to my next question. Um, uh, so um, if I can just kind of blast into this next one in our last five minutes here. Sure. Um, so there are several popular blockchain projects that claim to achieve scaling by being more of a connector or a hub for other chains. One calls itself the Internet of Chains. There's another calling itself a, in quotes, a heterogeneous multi-chain technology, unquote, that utilizes what they call a parachain or parallelizable chain. Parallelizable, I guess is the word that perhaps they invented. Parallelizable chain, and I quote, which attaches to the security provided by a, quote, relay chain rather than providing its own, 
The relay chain is called that because it not only lends security to attached parachains, but also provides a guarantee of secure message passing between them. So, unquote. So as I understand it, they're doing something different than our chain. They're more of a settlement layer that achieves scalability and a degree of basic interoperability by allowing different chains to run in parallel. But as I understand it, they aren't a, a global computer in their own right, the way that our chain's designed to be. W what I would like to understand is whether this type of multi-chain hub approach can fit into our chain's model somehow. And, and if so, whether it makes sense for us to include that kind of feature within our more comprehensive global computer. Um, I guess one thing I'm wondering is that since our chain is unique in that as a giant computer, it allows for all sorts of possible applications that other chains aren't offering, like content, storage, and search. Could we offer bridges or connector APIs of sorts that even though they may have limitations due to the less complete nature of their tech, they could still make use of some of our chain's features by plugging into our chain, so to speak? I think, Perhaps. yeah. So, 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 so Sorry, yeah. you go ahead, Greg. You go ahead. No, 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 no worries. I, mean, I think I think this is a you know, Daryl is asking a leading question, because in fact we've been talking about precisely that since the very beginning. The whole point of the sharding architecture is that our chain, our chain, treats uh, different chains that you want to coordinate into a, a, as a bunch of side chains with a parallel or a parachain coordinating amongst them. So that's what our chain does. It, tr it treats uh, separate chains as separate shards. So this sharding in, in our chain is not just about um, connecting different R chain shards, but also about connecting a bunch of different networks like Ethereum or Bitcoin or whatever underneath our chain and allowing our chain to be the para chain. Um, so it, it's already it's already built into the architecture from the beginning. Okay. But I want to I want to point out, and we've been saying this forever, right? Okay. Like the original white paper says this. But I also want to um, point out that um, the idea that somehow coordination uh, is computationally simpler than. Um, than the other chains, than the, than the side chains, is a complete misconception. Mm. And, I, and I, I've given examples from the literature that go back 40 years. Um, <clears throat> all you have to do is dip your toes in the relaxed transaction processing literature, uh, which is, <clears throat> you know, as a 40 year old subdiscipline of, of um, distributed computing. It's actually much older than that, right? Elliot Moss style nested transactions go uh, are much older than that. Um, and the 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 point is, you know, think about the kinds of coordination you might want to do. We could imagine uh, a, a network, um, you know, a bunch of different side chains that are all about the hospitality industry, right? For whatever reason, they've converged on such and such payments um, and booking networks. And then there's another um, set of chains that are all about air travel. And there's another set of chains that are all about renting a car. And now you, the coordinating chain wants to offer a service like, I wanna book a trip from here to there um, and I, I, need, I, need to, I need to book an air flight, I need to book accommodations, and I need to book a rental car. And I'm willing to take the hit if any one of those fails, but not if two of them fail. There, it's really simple logic. And you can see how this logic starts to get more and more complicated. For example, I'm only interested in electric cars unless there's a hybrid that's below a certain price. I'm only interested in um, uh, airlines that uh, support COVID screening, blah, 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 blah. The point is that the coordinating logic is at least as complicated 
as the, the uh, lo logic that goes on in the side chains. And so you need, you need a model, a general purpose model of compute. And guess what? That general purpose model of compute has to be concurrent because you want all of those activities that you're coordinating to run concurrently. That was the whole point of the parachain. So you need a general purpose model of computation that supports explicit concurrency. Which, which chain is offering that? <laughs> <laughs> which <Right>. one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I can think of anyone other than our chain, but I'm certainly not an expert. Right, but but, so, but this is this is this is the I mean I, I learned a long time ago because I got very interested in coordination technologies. It was clear a long time ago that um, the internet was going to be become you know a major economic engine, and there were going to be all these little fiefdoms that were going to have to be coordinated. And the question was, what could you get away with in terms of coordination technology? Mm -hmm. Could you could you get away with a model that was less um, rich than Turing complete. What are the features and functions of the, of the coordinating piece? Um, and you know, it turns out that that the R chain architecture is a direct result of about <laughs> thirty years of research trying to answer that question. Well, I think that's a perfect place to end it for today. Awesome. Unfortunately, we don't have more time, but I'm sure there's a lot of this that we can pick up next time. Yes. And I just also want to thank Steve Ross Talbot for joining us today. I know he had to drop off, but thank you all for joining th this week. And um, anybody that wants to become a member of our chain can do so at our chain.coop. Make sure you follow our chain on social media and subscribe on YouTube. And if you would like to be a guest, you can email climate at our chain.coop. And thank you everyone. And happy Chinese new year. Happy Chinese new year. Happy Losar. It's also uh the beginning of the miracle month and oh, also yeah and uh chick korea uh flew away uh today or last night the return and, to um, forever as it were exactly so i just want to to uh acknowledge his passing and what a remarkable life he lived thank you everybody thanks so, thanks